Have you ever dreamed of having a superpower? And if so, what would it be? Control time? Being invisible? Flying? Well, I can definitely not teach you how to fly, but I can tell you where you can find a magic cape that allows you to become invisible, be able to pass through enemies and spikes without receiving any damage. It allows you to bounce back and gives you the self-confidence to believe in yourself when no one else does. However, I have to warn you, the cape requires a high amount of magic energy in order to be used. And to access it, you have to walk through a bumper on Death Mountain. But the more bumpers you will hit, on your way, the stronger the power of your magic cape. And although the road to Death Mountain looks different to each and every one of us, we all have been there at one point. That Death Mountain I'm talking about is called failure. I spent my entire youth focusing on a professional career in sports. Since the age of six, I played both handball and football simultaneously. Ten years later, and countless hours of practice, discipline and sacrifice, I had made it into both the Bundesliga Academy of the Weinecke Löwen in handball and TSV Offenheim in football. At that time, I would practice twice a day, 10 to 12 times a week. I knew that at that point, I needed to decide in favor of one sport if I wanted to make the next step in my career. So I decided that I'd stop playing handball right after my final appearance for the youth national team of Germany in April 2007. Unfortunately, I waited so long with my decision that others went ahead and took it for me. So just when I quit the promising career in handball, Hoffenheim actually told me that they would no longer plan with me for the following season, as others had surpassed me. And with that day began a four year long odyssey of failure, or what I would later describe in a TED talk as my journey of collecting as many bumpers as I could to create the strongest imaginable magic cape. First, I moved to the Bundesliga Academy of Karlsruhe, only to be released after one single season while eight of my teammates went on to play in the first and second Bundesliga. Through a friend of mine, I received the opportunity to go on a trial with Scotch Premier League club Dundee United, but although their staff told me that I had done very well, the expected transfer actually never came through. So I ended up at Dynamo Dresden in the third division, where I was told that I'd get a chance to prove myself through good performances in their under-23 squad. Unfortunately, only four weeks into the season, the head coach, who was a fan of mine and who was one of the reasons why I decided to take on the risk, was fired. That was a huge setback, but I was still hopeful that this would be my breakthrough season. My hopes were even bigger when in October 2010, I gave my debut for the national team of my fatherland, Madagascar, during the African Nations Cup qualifier against Nigeria in front of 50,000 fans. I played well, almost scored, and even had the chance to switch my jersey with John Obi Mikel was back then playing for Chelsea. However, when I came back to Dresden, I wasn't even on the roster for the under 23 squad that played in the fifth division. So all the confidence I gained throughout the week vanished. During that season, I went on to collect six additional caps for the national team. And every time I would travel to the London 2012 Olympic qualifiers, for instance, against Algeria, my confidence would skyrocket. But all the time I got back to Dresden, I felt like I wasn't being taken seriously because, well, it was Madagascar and not Spain, Brazil or Italy. And that actually led me to believe that I wasn't good enough. I started doubting myself and I asked myself, are they right or am I right? And these constant negative inter internal conversations in my mind led me to actually make simple and stupid mistakes on the field, which ultimately justified why I didn't get a shot to play. That winter, after a tournament in South Africa, however, I received a phone call from FC Lorient, a League One club in France. One of their scouts had been seeing me play with the national team and invited me to a four-day tryout. So I flew out to France and thought I was finally getting my redemption. But yet again, although their manager told me that he was very happy with my performances during the week, the club decided not to acquire me because I hadn't played much in Germany. Now, just for perspective, that year Kevin Gamero their number one forward moved to Paris Saint-Germain for 11 million euros. And their number two forward, Morgan Amalfitano, transferred to Marseille for 6.5 million euros. And I? I stayed in Dresden for another season, where I wouldn't play a single second. But now, on top of the self-doubts, a negative thought pattern I had developed during that time, I also suffered a knee injury, which ruled me out for six months. So if you think about the bumpers, you might think, by now I should have collected them all, right? But the truth is, that was just the beginning. Because what's worse than having a club and not playing? Right, it's not having a club and not playing. 
So out of contract, out of options, and only 20 years of age, I decided to join a training camp for professional players without work, which was organized by the German Players Union. You can think of it as a boot camp where professional players from the first to the fourth division fight over a chance for a new contract. Or football's version of I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. So if rock bottom is here, I was here. But that acknowledgement that being real to myself, that I had to start all over again, actually felt liberating. So looking back, I would say the camp was actually a blessing in disguise. And I had the chance to get fit again and practice with several former Bundesliga players that helped me regain my confidence because I saw that I was capable to compete on that level. And my coaches would tell me that I had everything to become a top player, but I would just need to be patient and wait for my shot. I had regained faith in myself. In the last week of camp, that resilience I had developed seemed to pay off as my agent called me and told me, Tony, I've got great news. You're invited for a trial. This time with the under 23 team of Bundesliga side SF to Nuremberg. And I remember it as if it was yesterday. I got my confidence back. I was fit. I was crushing it during practice. Their coach told me that I was the fittest player they had seen in years. And that they would love to acquire me, but needed to wait for another forward to leave the club. So I waited and waited and waited until the last day of transfer window and nothing happened. That meant I was out of contract. I didn't have a club. I didn't have a salary, but the worst was that I didn't see a reason anymore to keep fighting. I had failed so many times. It couldn't be a coincidence that every time I felt close to achieving my goal, I failed again. And as I derived my entire identity from who I was as an athlete, I fell into a deep state of depression. I didn't see a reason to get up in the morning because I didn't have a goal, nothing to work for, nothing to look forward for. So I was staying in bed the entire day, I didn't see any reason to, to get up and do anything. I didn't even leave my apartment because I didn't want to meet people who could ask me what I was doing, where I was playing, and what my plans were for the future, because truth is, I had none. It was in March 2012, so around six months into unemployment, that Christian De Virtus called me. Christian and I had been in camp together, and he had recently signed with the first division club in Sweden. And he asked me, hey, Tony, do you have a contract by now? And I said, Christian, the only contract I have is a lease contract. <laughs> and I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to pay for it. So he started laughing and said, hey, have you ever considered of going to the United States to play college soccer while studying at the same time? I have a friend of mine who's got some contacts in Florida. And I didn't know anything about the system, but I had no choice and I liked the idea. So suddenly I got a new goal, something to work for, something worth fighting for, something to look forward for. Over the course of six months, I studied like a maniac and I busted my ass off to get the required test scores to start my college career. In April 2012, I signed my national letter of intent with a full scholarship contract worth around $40,000 a year to play and study at Florida Atlantic University. After all that time of hopelessness, suddenly I had found a new goal to work for and my life seemed to make sense again. On July 30th that year, two days before my birthday, three days before my flight, I received a call from the head coach who gave me the devastating news that I was not eligible to play for the university nor any other division one school in the country, which meant that I had to cancel my flight and the only plan that I had made for the future because my agent made a mistake in my application. It was absurd. I had won the freaking lottery of freaking bumpers. Although I cried like a little baby that night, I noticed something was different. This time, I wasn't going to take no for an answer. I didn't want to believe it, so I researched if there was any loophole in the system, any last straw that would allow me to do something out of my future. And I found one. So I picked up the phone and called around 40 coaches whose numbers I could find on the internet because this time, I wasn't going to put my faith into somebody else's hand. And 39 of the 40 coaches I called told me it was impossible because I had only two seasons of eligibility, which meant that I had to complete four years of study in two. And they said no. But one coach, one coach was willing to give me a shot. He said, Tony, you're a good player. We're a small school in Miami and I know you will help us. But the truth is, I don't think you'll be able to graduate in that time. No one has ever done it in two years. And I said, coach, I don't give a goddamn crap. When can I start? 
And so in January 2013, I left my family, I left my friends, I left my significant other behind and I moved to Miami to study. And I promised myself I would never allow anybody else to decide over my faith again. And I would do whatever it takes to never ever get back into a situation where others could decide over the course of my career. And I think when I was sitting on that plane into the unknown, my magic code started working. There is this quote by motivational speaker Jim Rohn that says, you become the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And boy, is that true. The first thing on campus, our team captain, Andrew Livingston from Scotland picked me up and I asked him, hey man, what's your GPA? And he said, 4.0 mate. And he said with such a fierce determination that I told myself one day, I wanted to say it just like he did. The second person that would have a deep impact on my journey was Edwin Mesa. Edwin was from Mexico and he was obsessed with being successful. He was by far the most determined person I've ever seen in my life. The reason for that was that he was initially supposed to go to a school in LA, but after only three days in the United States, he was arrested together with three of his friends on his way home from a party because the driver of the car was drunk. So he got kicked out of school, lost his visa and had to leave the country and had to start all over again. Back in Mexico, he contacted every problem in the United States, asking for a second chance. And as in my case, STU in Miami gave him a shot on condition that he maintains a minimum GPA. So his gratitude and failure became a driving force in everything he did in his life. The third one was Manuel Andreani from Italy. Manny and I would become very close because him and I were team captains in my second year. And he was very smart. And what inspired me most about him is that he didn't give a goddamn crap about what any other person would think about him. So every time we traveled with the team, he would sit in the back of the bus and study while everybody else was watching the movie or playing on his phone. And I will never forget the moment when two weeks before the end of the season, Manny walked up to me on the field and told me that he'd gone into Columbia University. It was hilarious. We were standing in the middle of the field, hugging each other with tears in our eyes. I was so proud of him because Columbia University was something that I only knew from the movies. And to know somebody in person who studied at one of the best schools in the world was mind-blowing to me. The fourth person that would play a big role in my life was Hisham Marini. Pitch would become my closest friend and in fact, we still talk almost every day. He was from Sweden and when he started college, his grades were so poor that he had to go to a junior college in San Francisco. And in California, he became obsessed with the startup world. And he would tell me all these stories about Silicon Valley, entrepreneurship, and that he would rather hustle 24 seven than slave from nine to five. Last but not least, Nacek de Mateos. Nacho was a senior from Spain who had played for Valladolid when he was younger. He was very smart, articulate, and very passionate. But Nacho couldn't function if he didn't take a siesta during the day. So he actually taught me that balance is the key to success in life. Fast forward two and a half years, I completely altered my perception and changed my idea of life. I graduated with a 4.0 and I got into Columbia University for my master's. Little did I know that an Ivy League education comes with a 200k price tag. <laughs> I knew that it was going to be impossible for my family to come up with such funding, but I had learned throughout my journey that when there is a will, there is a way. So I put on my magic cape and I asked the president of my school for an appointment and he asked me, how can I help you? And I told him, I've got good news and I've got bad news. Well then tell me the good news first, he said. So I took out my acceptance letter and put it on his desk. And he looked at me and said, well, that's fantastic. Congratulations, but what's the bad news? And I said, I don't know how to pay for it. And he looked at me and said, well, that's unfortunate, but what, what's that got to do with me? So I said, well, I was thinking, we are a very small school that basically no one outside of Miami has ever heard of. Our tuition is around 45K per year. Why don't you use my story of how this school turns average students into Ivy League candidates as marketing material? And if you only have two students on the planet that decide to come to this school because of my story, you have your return on investment. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, and I will never forget this, and it's the truth, Tony, you're a goddamn fucking smart son of a bitch. <laughs> and that part of the story becomes even funnier if you know that our president was actually a Catholic priest. So 
not even three years after being flushed out of the system and having no freaking clue what I was ever going to do with my life, I moved from Miami to New York City to study at one of the best schools in the world. And the first day of class, our professor told us, look around you. What I want you to understand is that the people you meet here are going to change the course of your life. I want you to understand that you are currently sitting in a seat that may have belonged to Barack Obama or Warren Buffett. And when they left this place, they went on to change the world. Well, I may have not changed the world, but an experience definitely changed my world. So when I moved back to Miami, I went on to launch a sports agency to help rejected yet highly talented players that may find themselves in a similar situation as I was in, discover alternative career pathways at American colleges and universities, but most importantly, to teach them the principle of never ever giving up on themselves and to teach them that every single bumper they meet in their life may just be the solution to find the magic cape. And the magic cape would later allow me to work with Wasserman, the world's second most valuable sports agency, which eventually put me back on the map of the professional sports world. Today, almost exactly eight years after I embarked on a journey into the unknown, I am back at my youth club TCG Hoffenheim, where I do now run the internationalization department. And apart from the fact that I get to work with really smart people that not only share the same values and belief system, what strikes me the most is that I do now have the chance to do my part to change the system for the better from the inside out. So the next time you walk through a bumper, remember that it might be the gateway to your magic code. We think of failure and success as opposites, when in reality, failure is part of success. Failure is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to evaluate how much we want something, or maybe don't really want it. If we're beaten down, if we've worked as hard as we can, if we've done everything we should, and it still doesn't work out, that's when you have to go back to the why of it. And that why is what makes the difference between those that are becoming masters of their destiny and those that will become victims of their history. Thank you.